All right. Good evening, everyone. How are you? This is Dr. Carla Raj, and I am coming to you live from wherever on this planet. <clears throat> oh, goodness. We have a pretty good lineup for today. The topic is, uh, once again, popular demand, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is what our topic is today. But more importantly, it's just a fact that... Man, we are in a new era. We are constantly evolving. You're constantly innovating. And the more that you learn to adapt, all of a sudden the world just seems like it is just full of opportunities. Yeah, we do medicine, but in the end, are you really doing what you love to do? That's what it comes down to. Did you do something today that you love to do? Mentally speaking so that in the long run, it then brings you the greatest satisfaction. Satisfaction, goodness gracious. Easier said than done, isn't it? So I welcome you to the Physician of Tomorrow, Teapot Clinic. My name is Dr. Carlo Raj, and we are in the process of creating Indus Intellect Institute, and the curriculum grows stronger every single day. There are more number of patients that are gonna come into your clinic, into your home, so that everyone is aware as to what's going on with their own health. With that said, I would like to uh, show you something that I find to be quite interesting. Oh, shoot. You know what? I'm just repeating myself here. So we're just going to mute you real quick, buddy. You can be quiet. Never take yourself too seriously, huh? already started this. Okay. Takes a second for things to buffer, I guess. All right. Uh, so our topic for today is COPD. And uh, just like I have been doing, uh, we're going to walk through some questions and I'm going to be using Lecturio uh, question bank only because I know that it is the best and it is the message board, board relevant. But before I do that, I wanna show you something that I find to be quite fascinating. Okay. And that is, I believe that this is coming through. And that is these stats that we see here. And these stats represent, look at this, $608 million per year in the year 2019. So that was last year is that we were spending on tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Many of you don't even know what that is, or you might have thought that it was a dinosaur, extinct, far from it. I want to show you something else. One out of five diabetics in the United States will be contriving tuberculosis. Do you realize there are 13 million Americans that have latent type of tuberculosis? Latent, you know what that means? It's just hiding within us. You start developing diabetes because we are obese as a nation. We start becoming immunocompromised and anything that might have been benign initially, all of a sudden now becomes malignant. And by that, I mean dangerous. In other words, life-threatening. And these are all just public figures. I'm not making this stuff up. Point being is, everything that we're contending with today, every type of disease, any type of virus, whatever it may be, take care of yourself first. Stop the drinking. Stop the smoking. Smart, st stop eating like there's no tomorrow. Stop the gluttony. Stop the depression. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. You're in control of your life. You're in control of something that you love to do every single day. Do it so that you bring contentment to yourself. And then maybe perhaps in the process, that is being shared. But wouldn't that be something? A novel idea, perhaps. One out of 21 who have HIV. Amazing that everything is just kind of going by the wayside because, you know, we have a pandemic going on right now. But really... The first thing that you need to make sure that you do is remove the fear. Remove the fear, understand thyself, 
understand what makes you function the best immunologically, mentally, physically, so that if, God forbid, you are then ridden with some type of illness, that you are prepared to deal with it. You do that first. It is amazing how everything else kind of takes care of itself automatically. And we don't have as much friction. We don't have as much violence. And then, therefore, peace automatically is just a way of life. But something to keep in mind. Pulmonary is our topic. And uh, we're going to enter the clinic at this point. We're going to enter the clinic. So let's do that. Welcome to Teapot Clinic. Look at our very, very attentive audience. Two individuals here who are watching the screen. They're watching the screen with Dr. Rubish and I with a medical school companion. How about that? There's a resource. There's Lopturio. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We're going to do some questions before we begin so that we get you warmed up. And then obviously we have some lectures or making sure that we're able to identify the differences between one of these patients has chronic bronchitis, the other patient has emphysema. And statistically speaking, we're going to walk through which patient has what and why one individual might be a little bit more obese versus one individual that seems to be a little bit, well, thin. Those are important differentiating points. But as I said, before we do any of that, let us now take a look at some questions. And for that, we'll go here. All right. So in our uh, teapot questions, we'll begin with, which one do I want to do? 15th? Yeah. All right, let's start our test, shall we? And remember, these questions are brought to you by Octavio. Let's make this a little bit bigger so that everyone's able to see this. Uh, it should be just enough. Okay. You have a 64 year old male presents to his uh, PCP for a follow up evaluation of a severe, unrelenting, productive cough for two years' duration. Now, stop there for one second. The topic for today is COPD. And the fact that this individual has had been coughing for about two years may then satisfy a criteria for which one? Is it emphysema? That's door number one. Or door number two would be chronic bronchitis. I'm going to stop there for one second because by definition, remember that three months of productive cough each year for two consecutive years is by definition chronic bronchitis. Look at the age of the individual, 64. Emphysema or chronic bronchitis might be 64 years of age. But this type of coughing may or may not be present in emphysema. But with that doubt so far, I'm leaning towards chronic bronchitis. What about you? The medical history includes a type of uh, type 2 diabetic, which is well controlled with insulin. He has a 25-pack year history of smoking and is an active smoker. But remember, if you're smoking, could you be? A patient has emphysema who's a smoker. Sure. Could there be a history of smoking with chronic bronchitis? Absolutely. So that doesn't help you differentiate between the two, but the definition of coughing taking place for three months per year for two consecutive years, that would lean towards chronic bronchitis. But remember in real life, in real life, in your clinic, in your clinic, the patient is smoking not only is that patient then introducing the antigens, and so therefore it's triggering the activity of neutrophilic elastase or protease, may result in central larvae type of emphysema, which we'll talk about today. Number two, may then cause enough irritation taking place in the bronchi and ultimately resulting in some type of hyperplasia of the mucus. There might be some squamous metaplasia. Remember, go, back, go into your bronchi. Can you do that for me? And all that mucus production. So Dr. Roger is saying that if a patient is a smoker, it could be vaping, it could be cigarettes, whatever it may be that you're smoking with enough irritation, 
your patient is not going to strictly present with emphysema. Impossible. The patient is not going to strictly present with chronic bronchitis. You're going to have a patient on your step one, step two CK, and step three, and in your clinic forevermore, who's going to have a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis always. It's just, where is that needle swinging towards? Is it swinging towards the chronic bronchitis more so? So let's take, a, let's take a look at the flares that I want to manage in that patient. Those are the type of questions that you're going to get. Or is it leading towards more emphysema? In which there's destruction of your parenchyma due to the elastase activity resulting in the barrel chest, the flattening of the hemidiaphragm, and so forth. And then the management there may be something like, apart from the bronchodilators, how about some lung reduction volume surgery? We'll be talking about that. You'll get a question on that guaranteed on step one, step two CK, and definitely on step three. Let's continue. The patient's blood pressure is uh, anything remarkable here? Maybe a little bit of increase in breathing. Now, bilateral wheezes and crackles are heard on auscultation. What does that mean to you? Wheezes and auscultation. What does that mean to you? That means that my patient has fluid down in the lungs. Let me do crackles for you. You ready for crackles? Does that sound like Velcro? It is exactly what it is. That's crackles that you're hearing when you place your step on your lungs. It's Velcro. What does that mean to you? What does that actually mean to you clinically? What the heck is going on with the patient? Fluid accumulation. Hmm. Now, do you think that you'd find a greater tendency of fluid accumulation in chronic bronchitis? Or would there be a greater tendency of finding fluid in the lungs with emphysema? What do you think? What's your answer? Bring it, bring it, bring it. Chronic bronchitis, fluid accumulation, edema. We'll be talking about that further. We'll be talking about the pathogenesis of that. And as to why that patient would then be accumulating fluid. Now of the two patients that we're gonna walk through, remember that obese, heavy set male, and that's scrawny male. We'll walk through those in a second. Which one of those individuals do you think may be retaining water. Yeah, the heavyset male. So you have a heavyset male, you're thinking more along the lines of chronic bronchitis if you are referring to COPD. Let's continue. Chest X-ray reveals cardiomegaly, increased lung markings, flattening of the diaphragm. Which of the following is uh, most likely in this patient? I told you, you're never just gonna have one thing. You're gonna have a combination of both emphysema and chronic bronchitis because the patient is smoking. Is that clear? You're not just going to have flattening of the diaphragm barrel chest without some chronic bronchitis element, or you're not just going to have chronic bronchitis with the three months of coughing over a two-year span without a little bit of bloating. You can't. You're going to have both presentations. Keep that in mind. That's important. So what do you think is happening? Huh? Chronic bronchitis or emphysema? Keep that in mind as we go through the answer choices. Increased right ventricular compliance. Oh, goodness gracious, take your time. What does compliance mean to you? Does that mean that that compartment that's becoming more compliant is more like a balloon? As soon as you start blowing up, it just starts filling up so easily. Whoop. Is that what's happening with the right ventricle? Is there fluid accumulation within the right ventricle, which may then result in a type of, you've heard of, eccentric hypertrophy, right? Eccentric hypertrophy? versus concentric? What kind of hypertrophy do you think you may then find if it is COPD? Take your time. Here's a pathogenesis. This is the thinking that you want to go through. Ready. Tell me about hypoxemia that's taking place in your patient's COPD. Hypoxemia. Hypoxemia. Present in both, right? Both. Chronic bronchitis? Oh, I have hypoxemia. Emphysema? I have hypoxemia. Is it acute or chronic? Uh, it's called COPD, yeah, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So chronically, you're gonna have hypoxemia, yes. The chronic hypoxemia that is now taking place, let's say of your lung tissue, how does the lung vasculature then respond? If you remember, when there's hypoxia taking place, is it vasodilation or is it vasoconstriction? Is it vasodilation or is it vasoconstriction? It's one of those exceptions, isn't it, in the lung? When it is undergoing hypoxic situations, that the blood vessels within the lungs are then undergoing what? 
It's called hypoxic vasoconstriction. Now I'm going to make it more interesting for you because you're not just going to get a pathology question, anatomy question, physio question, pharmacology question. You're going to get everything in one, in one bundle. Let it be the cases that we're going to go through. Let it be the question. The point being is what does vaso mean to you? Is it the V in ventilation or is it the Q in perfusion? We're referring to the VQ ratio. That you will have to know, ladies and gentlemen, forevermore. It's called the VQ ratio. V is ventilation. That's the alveoli. Q is perfusion. That's your vasculature. So now I'm telling you that when there is hypoxia, there's going to be what? Hypoxic vasoconstriction of the pulmonary blood vessels. When you have vasoconstriction, are you going to have increase or decrease in perfusion? Vasoconstriction. You're going to have decrease in perfusion. Where is the perfusion in the VQ ratio? In the denominator. When you decrease the denominator, what happens to the ratio? Uh, simple math, second grade, maybe kindergarten. When I decrease the denominator, I increase the ratio. That is correct. So mathematically, I have just explained to you why hypoxic vasoconstriction is then going to result in an increase in VQ ratio in the hopes of having proper matching of the V and the Q. Because you know in COPD, What's being compromised? The V, the ventilation. Therefore, physiologically, mathematically, what would you like to do with the perfusion? If you have any control over it, which we do physiologically, reflexively, in which I would decrease the denominator. How about some hypoxic vasoconstriction? That's exactly what happens. That hypoxic vasoconstriction decreases the Q in the denominator, increasing the ratio up towards 0.8. Don't memorize 1.0 from first aid anymore. That's going to mess you up. The clinical technical VQ ratio that you must know for every single step is 0 0.8. Is 0 0.8 that you must know. All that you just got from a question. Let's continue. So now when you have hypoxic vasoconstriction, do you not eventually result in pulmonary hypertension? Yes or no? Yes. Pulmonary hypertension. So when you have pulmonary hypertension taking place, that means that the right ventricle is then facing increased afterload. Dr. Raj, I thought afterload was only for the left ventricle. Are you serious right now? No, afterload just means what is the resistance that the ventricle is facing when either the aortic or in this case, the pulmonic valve is opening during systole. Yeah, I know, I get it. Most of the time you are talking about your Aortic stenosis. I get it. I know that you're talking about highland arterial sclerosis on the left side of the heart and all, all that stuff. But don't restrict yourself on your boards and clinically. That make, you're, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> so therefore, that increase in afterload that you're feeling, seeing or feeling or experiencing, secondary to pulmonary hypertension, secondary to hypoxia vasoconstriction, is then resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy. That right, right ventricular hypertrophy is not of the eccentric type because it's not fluid that's causing the hypertrophy, not the eccentric type. It's increase in pressure due to the pulmonary hypertension, therefore resulting in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of the right ventricle. Is that clear? That hypertrophic or concentric hypertrophy taking place at the right ventricle is then called stiffening of the right ventricle. Stiffening, you would not have an increase in right ventricular compliance. Aren't these beautiful questions? Bacterial, QBank, do them. There are 2,000 of them, 17,000 recall questions, constantly asking you questions every step of the way so that you just get into the habit of being befuddled for that brief moment. So that by the time you take your step, by the time you have any type of patient that's walking through a clinic, you have answered 99% of the questions that are then going to be presented to you in any way, shape, or form. Let's continue. Increased pulmonary arterial resistance. Which of the following is most likely? Is that a possibility? I want to hang on to B. What about you? Increased cerebrovascular resistance. Oh, that's interesting. When there's hypoxia, how does the brain then respond, please? Remember, the lung is undergoing vasoconstriction. No doubt. No doubt. But that's an exception. The skeletal muscle, the brain, for Pete's sakes, is undergoing vasodilation. Come on now. So you're not going to have increased cerebrovascular resistance. You're going to have decreased cerebrovascular resistance. 
decrease carbon monoxide content in the uh, arterial blood. Uh, excuse me, but when you have COPD, do you have difficulty with breathing out? Or do you have difficulty breathing? <gasps> you have difficulty breathing out. That's the obstruction. When you do a loop spirometry, the loop spirometry loop, there it is. You're going what? You're going what? Clockwise, aren't you? It's clockwise. And when you go clockwise in the top half of the loop spirometry, you're going to find a scalp portion of the exhalation or expiration half. That's COPD. So if you have difficulty breathing out, uh, do you think you're going to be retaining or do you think that you're going to be blowing off more carbon dioxide? Uh, retaining carbon dioxide. Isn't it true, ladies and gentlemen, that when you're suffering from a lung injury, that for the most part, clinically, your patient is then going to have a PCO2 greater than 40? Yes. PCO2 greater than 40, resulting in respiratory acidosis, right? That's your clinical interpretation. This patient has COPD. This patient is not going to be blowing off carbon dioxide by the time your patient walks into your clinic. Mm -mm. It's going to be respiratory acidosis, so therefore you can rule out D. Not a decrease, but an increase in CO2. So far, we ruled out A, C, and D. And then I just told you, acidosis. What's acidosis mean to you? A pH less than 7.35. This is an increase in pH of the arterial blood. What's your answer, ladies and gentlemen? Undoubtedly, walking through the pathogenesis. This patient has, component, um, this patient has components of both COPDs, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. The definition of chronic bronchitis initially, and then the physical findings on your chest x-ray and such of emphysema. But ultimately, is that what you're going to be hung up on? Hopefully not. We have a resounding answer here, without a doubt, is B, as in boy, because this then refers to pulmonary hypertension. All right, let's continue. We have about 45 minutes more. We're going to have more fun. Oh, we're going to have more fun. <laughs> At least I am. Yeah, best thing about this is I just really love what I do. Can you tell? All right, we are in our clinic, and uh, let's take a look at our patients now. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. We're going to walk around you, walk around you, and uh, before we do that, let me switch over to what we're going to be looking at today. Dun, dun. Okay. Uh, COPD. Turn around in the clinic. Oh, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Clinic. I am just so proud of these patients, really am. Because each one of them will listen to what I'm telling them and they're gonna get better because they take care of the underlying issue. <laughs> All right, let's do... Uh... The patient over to the right the patient over to the right seems a little bit stocky, seems overweight, without a doubt, right? The patient over to the left, scrawny, skinny, and upon closer examination even. Oh, hello, mister. How are you? We call you Mr. Ed. I know most of you are probably not as old as I am, but I grew up with Mr. Ed. A little bit of cyanosis taking place here. Look how scrawny. Look at the chest. Look at the wrinkles in your patient. Whereas, take a look at this patient here. Obese, stocky. If I had to give an age between the two, the one on the left seems to, seems to be a little bit older. And the patient over to the right seems to be a little bit younger. But uh, they definitely both seem like they're above the age of 40. Okay, and uh, now I'm going to tell you about the history in the patient, and then I'll walk you through the content. That's the best way to do it. The patient over to the right, we'll go, we'll go ahead and call him. Uh, we'll go ahead and call him uh, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce comes in and tells you that he's been coughing for quite some time. You ask him about the quality of the cough, and he says that it's been productive. And sputum is coming in. How long does a cough last? Well, he says that the cough has been going on for about three months this year. 
this year. Hmm. And uh, for how many years have you been having this length of cough of at least three months? Well, he says maybe for the past two and a half years. So for consecutive two, two and a half years, this patient has been having three months of productive cough. What do you think? Definition of chronic bronchitis. You're leaning towards that diagnosis in this patient over to the right in COPD. In COPD, my issue is I can't get enough air out in one second. That's the most important quantitative. I repeat, of the two parameters of your pulmonary function test, if you V1, force expiratory volume in one second, over force vital capacity, you're not giving it time. You're not. If you see, you're not giving it time in the denominator. If you V1, sure you are. So the point being is, in one second, this patient is not able to get out the air. Let's say if it was five liters of air, that's lung volume. Usually a patient will be able to get out four of those liters. And it gives you approximately 0 0.8, right? So normal FEV1 to FEC ratio is about 80%. We should be able to get out 80% of that air in one second. This patient, however, with chronic bronchitis was unable to do so. But not just this patient. This patient over to left says that, Doc, I am having issues with uh, walking my dog. So in other words, a dyspnea upon exertion. Not pain, but dyspnea, shortness of breath upon exertion when walking his dog. What about the cough? Faint, and if I have it, it's rather dry. And both of these patients do have 25 year, we'll say. We'll keep it the same. 25 year pack of smoking history. That's a long time of smoking. So both of these patients have COPD. Both of these patients will then have FEV1 to FEC ratio, significantly lower than 0 0.8. But that doesn't tell you the difference. So both are smoking, but the coughing is much more productive in the chronic bronchitis patient over to the right, who is more stocky, overweight, versus the patient over to the left, who is scrawny and thin, who's a smoker. And the labs then show you hypoxemia. The labs also then show you that there is retention of carbon dioxide. The coughing is rather scant. Then we're going to do a chest x-ray in this patient that I'm going to show you. The chest x-ray that I'm going to show you in this patient over to the left is skinny and scrawny. He's going to have a barrel chest. So what I'm trying to tell you is do not allow the size of the patient to then deceive you in terms of the barrel chest. You do not have to be obese and stocky and overweight to have a barrel chest. All that is occurring in emphysema, as we shall take a look at, is that there's this destruction of the lung parenchyma or the elastic tissue. And because of that, the lung then becomes more compliant. And the patient over here is skinny and scrawny. The cough is not mucopurulent. So you're now going to have the three months of productive cough over two years. But this patient is indeed going to have a barrel chest, hyperlucency, hyperinflation taking place at both sides of the lung bilaterally. There's going to be flattening of the hemidiaphragm on both sides. I'm also then going to show you that increased space between the sternum and the lungs. In other words, retrosternal space. I'm also going to then show you that there's going to be increased markings of the pulmonary artery, perhaps due to the development of pulmonary hypertension. But both of these patients could then have that as well. But the barrel chest, the patient here. Management and chronic bronchitis, well, in both of these patients, you're going to ease off on the smoking, aren't you? And then we'll discuss a little bit more as to what you want to do with these patients in terms of chronic bronchitis with all that hyperplasia of the mucus. And you want to try to control the flares. So what you're trying to do is control the cough as much as possible in a conservative fashion. Your first step of management in this patient, chronic bronchitis, Doctors is not to give antibiotics immediately. Why? Because of antibiotic resistance. And that is a big deal. You're going to start off with lozenges and hot tea and so forth, maybe some expectorant, 
and uh, be careful as to what kind of cough suppression. And we'll be discussing that soon enough. Now that you have a clear picture in our TPOC clinic of the two patients that have COPD, the patient over to the right is diagnosed with chronic bronchitis, notably. And the patient over to the left is diagnosed with emphysema, notably. But, but these patients will then indeed have components of both. So with that said, we're going to get and begin our discussion a little bit here for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Put the all this together. To right. Is diagnosed with chronic bronchitis. What is that about? Notably. The patient over to the left is diagnosed with emphysema. Oh, goodness notably. gracious. But, but these patients will then indeed <laughs> have components of both. Okay. That's interesting. Hopefully you can continue to hear me. Let's make sure that we're good with the... Uh, speakers. So yeah, we're good. I'm getting green. Sometimes technology just kind of has a mind of its own. Best thing to do is make sure that you don't panic. If you panic, then everything is gone, isn't it? True of everything in life, period. So try not to react as much as possible. And if you do, identify that it's occurring in yourself so that you're able to calm down, however that may be, so that you're able to then deal with the task at hand in a successful manner, period. You control that, you control a lot of things in your life. Most importantly, your patients. COPD, the patient over to the left, we call them pink puffers. Why do we call them pink? We'll be discussing that soon enough. The patient over to the right, you call this patient a blue bloater. Why do we call this uh, chronic bronchitis patient a blue bloater? We shall discuss that soon enough. What does blue mean to you? Cyanosis. Chronic bronchitis will present with early cyanosis. Now, the cyanosis could also occur with an emphysema patient, but it takes a little bit longer, and we'll understand that moving forward. Now, we've done the presentation, so I can walk through that. First, the history of your chronic bronchitis patient. Both of these patients are smokers, so that's going to be nonspecific. However, chronic bronchitis patients tend to be overweight. We've talked about the sputum being further developed in a chronic bronchitis patient. In the onset of, of uh, symptoms, chronic bronchitis patients tend to be a little bit younger, in other words, greater than 40. Emphysema, we're talking about greater than 60, 65. Next, remember the definition, three and two. What does three and two mean? Three months of productive cough every year for consecutive two years. So three months of productive cough consecutively for greater than two years. Dyspnea, mild. So chronic bronchitis tends to uh, present with dyspnea maybe later on in their presentation. What does the chronic bronchitis patient then complain of? Dyspnea upon exertion, obviously hypoxemia. There's going to be fatigue, insomnia, and then decreased libido, probably maybe due to, let's say, obesity, maybe concomitant uh, type 2 diabetes, right? So all that is then going to further contribute to decreased libido. Pink, pink represents, or pinkish, represents emphysema. There's this patient here. Lifestyle, once again, smoker. So stop the smoking is your first step of management. We'll be discussing as to what's occurring pathogenesis-wise with the smoking soon enough. Weight, skinny. Coughing, not as much. Mild sputum. Patient tends to be older, greater than 50 on average. I gave you a patient that was 65. So the age didn't tell you whether or not it was one or the other. You had to go through the history. And in our patient that I did the question with you, we found components of both emphysema with the diaphragm being flattened and then with the definition of chronic bronchitis. Coughing, absent. The dyspnea is going to be quite extensive. This is the skinny patient that I showed you in our clinic. The patient complains with emphysema. These are nonspecific. Dyspnea upon exertion, fatigue, and then insomnia. The decreased libido tends to be a little bit more in chronic bronchitis because of the obesity. All right, now we're going to slow down just a little bit. We're going to talk about this patient here. And by that, I mean the chronic bronchitis, stocky, overweight individual. Before we move on, let's talk about a few things. Chronic bronchitis. The name itself tells you that pathogenesis is occurring within the bronchi. Need you to go ahead and picture trachea, the bifurcation, and the bronchi. We're not reaching the bronchioles. Okay, we're not reaching the bronchioles. 
Number one cause of chronic bronchitis in the United States is smoking, vaping. What you're doing then is then causing irritation of the bronchi. The irritation of the bronchi is then undergoing certain changes. Now, if it was smoking only, there's every possibility. Remember that the histology of the bronchi is ciliated columnar, is it not? Yes, it is. Ciliated columnar. If you're smoking, the manner in which the bronchi will protect itself from the antigens that are being introduced is that the histology then changes from columnar to squamous. It's called squamous metaplasia. In fact, all doctors know, and we have an issue, because in the United States, the number one killer, the number one cancer killer in the U.S., without a doubt, is lung cancer. Now, it's not squamous cell cancer of the lung. It's actually called non-small non -small cell lung cancer, specifically adenocarcinoma, but it is a type of bronchogenic carcinoma. What is the squamous metaplasia that may take place with smoking, right? You may then go into dysplasia. And then worst case scenario, from dysplasia, you then go into your squamous cell cancer of the lung, which is extremely deadly. Because once that patient develops squamous cell, goodness gracious, you start thinking about palliative care. You know, sometimes in terms of treatment and management and surgery, it may, may cause further harm and further inconvenience than the actual cancer itself. Anyhow. That's a possibility. Continue our discussion on chronic bronchitis. And instead of developing the cancer in the lung, what may then happen is that you will then have hyperplasia taking place of the mucus. We'll be discussing that soon enough. There's hyperplasia taking place in the mucus. Remember, this patient with chronic bronchitis is doing what? It's coughing quite a bit. And for how long? Three months of productive cough over two consecutive years, by definition. Your number one step of management is, apart from taking care of the smoking, is also then taking care of the, the coughing. Now, in, in the form of managing the coughing, you start off conservatively. So you start thinking about giving lozenges, hot tea, so on and so forth. If that doesn't work, be careful with antibiotics because, yes, there are times in which you will have to then administer antibiotics. For example, you can have a COPD patient that may then have com concomitant Mophilus influenza infection. It may also then perhaps develop Marxilla catarellus. Those are two very common bacterial infections that may then superimpose in COPD, hence further contributing to the chronicity and maybe even the comorbidity in your patient. All right. Now that we have a basic understanding of what we're going to be looking at in chronic bronchitis, let's continue. Always do that. Don't just blindly read. Do not blindly just listen. Be proactive with your learning so that it actually sticks in your head. You do that for everything. Now, that mucus plug that you have placed in the bronchi, in the bronchi, distally you have your bronchioles. Yes. So if you have the mucus plug in the bronchi, what's going to happen to those bronchioles in the alveoli distally? They're going to perish. They're going to perish. Now, what does that mean? Well, now things get more interesting. I say more interesting because, oh, goodness gracious, we're going to draw a little bit. Or I thought we were. Yes, we were. But in the meantime, what I want you to think of is if those alveoli are dead and they're obliterated, in other words, atelectasis, if you don't have the alveoli, how in the world are you supposed to get oxygen in there? You cannot. So the fact that you cannot get, the fact that you cannot get oxygen into the alveoli means that the blood, which is supposed to then pick up the oxygen, is unable to do so. If you're unable to then pick up the oxygen from the pulmonary alveoli, then you're going to shunt from the pulmonary arterial side to the pulmonary venous side. So quickly here, we're just going to draw that out so that you have a clear picture in your head. So now what happens is that you have an alveoli. Or in the case of chronic bronchitis, because there's a mucus plug here, let's say in the bronchi. So we'll call that a plug, a mucus plug. 
due to the hypersecretion of mucus, that this alveoli is now obliterated. We call this atelectasis. In the meantime, from the pulmonary artery, which has decreased oxygen, you're then going to move through the pulmonary capillary, and you're going to shunt right past this dead alveoli. Obviously not called a cardiac shunt, not an ASD, VSD, or PDA. It's called an interpulmonary shunt. So that decreased amount of oxygen that then began way back in the pulmonary artery from the right ventricle. Picture that, please. And it's moving towards the pulmonary veins. In the meantime, you have your capillaries here. Is it supposed to pick up the oxygen? Is it not? But it can't because literally alveoli is dead due to the mucus plug. That is a type of atelectasis that you're seeing there. You then result in interpulmonary shunt. When that shunt then takes place in the pulmonary vein, remember that you're supposed to have a P, little a, O2, of let's say approximately 95 to 100 millimeters mercury of oxygen. That never happened. So therefore this patient continues to be hypoxemic. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And so therefore this patient is then going to appear as being cyanotic very, very quickly. So that takes care of the blue. Not quite yet, but it, one of the contributors to the blue, the cyanosis. What else may happen? This is COPD. We're talking about the years, right? So we're talking about two years, definitely greater than two years, clinically speaking. Emphysema, same concept. If you're hypoxemic, right? So you have, let's say that you find on your ABG or your blood gas that the PO2 is going to be less than, oh goodness gracious, 95. We're going to go ahead and say less than 80. We're going to go ahead and say it's less than 60, in fact. That's common, unfortunately. Hmm. Not a discussion to talk about today, but when that PO2 drops below 60, please know that a chemoreceptor is in the peripheral, in the carotid, in the carotid, the chemoreceptors. So there you have what's known as your uh, carotid bodies and your carotid sinuses. And within the carotid bodies, you didn't have your peripheral chemoreceptors. And for discussion on another day, then we would say that when the PO2 drops below 60, and no doubt your peripheral chemoreceptors will then be triggered. That's the only way that this patient is then breathing. We call that hypoxic drive. That's extremely important. And any of you that are in the R, any of you that are taking step one, step two, step three, whatnot, you all know the importance of hypoxic drive completely dependent upon the peripheral chemoreceptors. That's key. And where is it located? Not the carotid uh, sinus, but the carotid bodies. I mean, you also have an aortic, but your focus, no doubt, clinically, is the carotid bodies. Because remember, the carotid sinuses contain baroreceptors. Not a topic. All right, now, point being is hypoxic drive is taking place over months, definitely over months. If you go into high altitude, one month later, one month later, the kidney will kick in. And that kidney will kick in and will start increasing production of a hormone called EPO. EPO stands for erythropoietin, correct? Erythropoietin. And how long is this patient with COPD suffering from hypoxemia? Months and years. So what do you think EPO levels will be in this patient? Extremely high. That EPO is then going to trigger the bone marrow to then do what? Increase erythropoiesis, increase RBC production. This hypoxemia that is then triggering the erythropoiesis is then referred to primary or secondary polycythemia. All your patients with COPD will be presenting with secondary polycythemia. I'm going to put secondary poly. It's also called appropriate absolute. It's appropriate because of the hypoxemia. It's absolute because you're absolutely increasing your erythropoiesis. All, of, all that information that I'm giving you is golden. It's going to get you points on your boards. It's going to save lives when you have your clinic, period. No questions asked. Facts are what I'm giving you. Everything is relevant. Everything is relevant. It's up to you as to whether or not you wish to learn it, to practice it, so that you can be the best darn physician you can be. Let's continue further. So we have a shunt taking place. We have secondary polycythemia. This is chronic bronchitis. The alveoli is not present. All these RBCs that are coming, they're going to be empty of oxygen. Further contributing to what? Cyanosis. Imagine how blue you are. 
you think you're having a blue day? You ask a patient with COPD and chronic bronchitis, man, are they having a blue day? <laughs> Let's continue. Where do we go from here? Oh, we have good stuff. Interpulmonary shunts. Come on. Cyanosis we've talked about. I can clear all this stuff now. We're kind of getting in our way. VQ ratio. Severely compromised. I talked to you about how you would then have uh, in chronic bronchitis, you've lost the alveoli. And therefore, a decrease and decrease and decrease in VQ ratio. And what does that mean to you? Remember that ratio is normally 0 0.8. That's what you want to use, not 1.0 from first aid, please. That's a day of the, uh, the that's information of the old. You're going to be using 0 0.8, so do not forget that. So you're then going to find a decrease in VQ ratio, less than 0 0.8. Maybe it's a 0 0.5 in chronic bronchitis. What is the Q going to do? What's Q mean to you? Perfusion. What's Q mean to you? Perfusion. What does that mean to you anatomically? Vasculature. What would you like to do with the denominator so that you can increase the ratio again, please? What would you like to do with the denominator so that you can increase the ratio? I would like to decrease the denominator. I would like to decrease the perfusion. What would you like to do with the vasculature? Vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction causes a decrease in perfusion, therefore causing an increase in the ratio. Hopefully trying to bring it back towards normal. Is that beautiful? Mathematically? That's what the body's trying to do. Hence, it's called hypoxic vasoconstriction. But if that occurs long enough, which it occurs here in chronic bronchitis, you're going to develop, remember a question? You're going to have increased pulmonary arterial resistance resulting in pulmonary hypertension. What does that mean to you? You should know that pulmonary artery has an approx approximate pressure of 15 millimeters mercury. All this should be in your head, nowhere else. In your head, nowhere else. That's normal. Now, what then happens in pulmonary hypertension by definition of pathology is that it increases and gets above 25 millimeters mercury. Amazing. Whenever you find, let's say on Swan Gans catheter, for instance, that you find the pulmonary arterial pressure to be above 25, no doubt your patient is suffering from pulmonary arterial hypertension. Huh. If that occurs, what then happens to the right ventricle, please? Right ventricle hypertrophy. What happens to the compliance of the right ventricle when there's concentric hypertrophy? Decreases because the right ventricle wall has now become thickened, not due to fluid, but due to pressure. Do not ever forget that. Why? Because if that right ventricle dies, secondary to a pulmonary pathology, what is that called? Oh, now I'm speaking your language. Cor pulmonal. Merci beaucoup. Hmm? Corpomenal, merci beaucoup. Right sided heart failure, secondary to pulmonary issues. Is that a possibility in chronic bronchitis? Unfortunately, yes. How about emphysema? Mm, less likely. That's important to differentiate between chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Keep that in mind. Oh, things are getting better. So, which means that I'm going to show an ECG that's going to show you what? Right axis deviation. It's going to show you that instead of the mean electrical axis moving towards lead two, it's going to be moving towards leads two, three, AVF and lead V1. What does that mean? Right side of the heart. Right side of the heart. Yeah. Leads two, three, AVF, right coronary artery, V1. Is it pre-cordial leads facing over to the right? Not good for the patient. Not good with that. It's all began with smoking. Goodness gracious. Your right side of the heart just died. Okay, let's continue. Be healthy, best that you can. No guarantees, but goodness gracious, try to improve the odds. I'm mean, I die tomorrow. I'm a happy man. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna die of, but I don't really care. Bronchi. Goblet sarper, please. Remember, everything is about mucus production, isn't it? Everything is about mucus production. You know, goblet cell hyperplasia. You're going to have hyperplasia of the mucus secreting gland. That's important. Really important. Why? Because I'm going to show you this. Oh, I'm going to show you this. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, am I still coming through? Yes, I am. All right. Call the read index. What does that even mean? Let me show you. Let me show you what it means. 
This is normal. Why is that kind of out of whack? Let's get that better. There we go. I like that better. All right. Um, this is normal. What are we looking at, Dr. Raj? This is what you're looking at. Here's the lumen of the bronchi. Lumen of the bronchi here. So that would mean that these are epithelial cells. I'm just going to put EPI. This is then known as your basal membrane. And the boundary from the epithelial cells all the way through to the boundary of the perichondrium, cartilage. And we'll call this A to B. Right. So the basal membrane of the epithelium of the, uh, the towards the lumen of the bronchi, and then deep towards the cartilage of perichondrium, that ratio there is called A to B. And then from here to here, we'll call that C to D. Do not memorize the letters for Pete's sakes. <laughs> you can change up the letters at any point in time. But what you do need to understand is that you're then going to take the ratio of C to D in the numerator, which is the span of the mucus gland over A to B which is the span of the thickness of the wall of the bronchi. So you're going to take the span of the thickness of the wall of the bronchi, A to B, in the denominator. And then in the numerator, you're then going to put the thickness of the mucous gland layer. <laughs> you're going to put the thickness of the mucous gland layer in the numerator, C to D. Do not memorize the letters. Understand the concept. And then that's going to be over the, the thickness of the layer of the bronchi, which is then your A to B. <laughs> That's normal, by the way. This is normal. And it should be less than 0 0.5. You can use that for a step. That'll be fine. Right. 0 0.5. Versus what? Ah, now I'm going to show you chronic bronchitis. What can you expect? What can you expect? Lots of hyperplasia of your mucus. Yes. And that's what we're looking at here. All I'm going to do for you is the following. We're going to take... The C to D, I'll move this cartilage. Can't even see the cartilage on this page because they're just not present. Or should I say, it's been displaced that much by what? All of this is mucus, which means the ratio increased like crazy. The C to D, hypersecretion, hypersecretion, hyperplasia of the mucus glands. The goblet cells will be over here. You see these? Make this a color that's a little bit more. These areas in which it almost looks like, looks like it's clear because it's goblet cells further contributing to mucus production. So you have goblet cell metaplasia and all of this is going to be hypersecretion and mucus gland. So no wonder the ratio now, instead of 0 0.5, will be greater than 0. Point, I mean, it will be greater than 0 0.5 because the ratio is increased due to hyperplasia of the mucus gland. That is rate index. That's read index. Do not just memorize it. Understand exactly what I've given you here in terms of what you're calculating. You know that? You're good to go. Let's continue. Shall we? Are you good? Yeah, you're great. You're great. Emphysema pathogenesis. What about this? Let me put it this way. It's the imbalance that's taking place between protease Stop there for a second. Oh, I'm so cool. Breathing in all those antigens, 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 antigens. You know what's going on in the lungs? You're introducing foreign objects and antigens into your body. It's literally going out there and then let's say taking bacteria and putting it into your, into your body. It's literally going out there and putting in some kind of uh, chemical such as radon into your body. Let me have cancer, please. Can I have cancer, please, by putting in all these antigens into my body? Best of luck. Point being is when you introduce antigens, bacterial, chemical, talc, smoking, whatever it may be, you're going to mount an immune response. Whew. 
and immune response. You're going to have neutrophilic infiltration taking place in the lungs because it's trying to get rid of the hundreds and thousands of chemicals. And that, those neutrophils are then releasing elastases, 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 a.k.a. proteases. They were trying to go after the antigen to destroy that. But what ends up happening is that you start, smoke rises, and it's just normal nature. So therefore, the elastases and the proteases are then going to cause a destruction up in the upper lobes. I'm not even discussing alpha-1 antitrypsin, so do not bring that into discussion right now. Not yet. It's all about the elastase, a.k.a. protease, causing destruction, not just of the antigen, but also collateral damage of the lung parenchyma. What I've given you here, because now you've tested for alpha-1 antitrypsin, I can tell you that. I'll tell you the gene soon enough for alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's called Serpin-1A. Serpin, S-E-R stands for serine. P-I stands for protease inhibitor. Serpin, what a beautiful name. So you check for the genes and such for serpin 1A and chromosome 14. It's all there. So you don't have a problem with alpha-1 antitrypsin is the point. So the protease inhibitor is there, but the problem is that you have too much protease activity. And that protease activity and the elastase activity is then therefore causing damage to the lung parenchyma. Where? In the upper lobes. Do you call this pan a sinar? Do you call this pan everything a sinar? Destruction? Nope. You call this central lobular or center a sinar? Same thing. Central lobular or center a sinar emphysema tends to cause destruction in the upper lobes because the neutrophils that are then being introduced in abundance to the upper lobes, because that's where the smoke antigens are, the, you know, the, the, the nitrogens and all that good stuff, is then causing issues and causing damage to the parenchyma. Call that central lobular emphysema. Now, what does that mean? So you have the alpha-1 antitrypsin in there, no doubt. Why right, do you do? But the problem is it's being overwhelmed, right? War taking place across the world, across the world. Border disputes, let it be between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the war between, uh, let's say, China and India, the border wars that are taking place everywhere around the world. And at some point in time, point being is one entity is then going to feel overwhelmed. Here, the entity of your alpha-1 antitrypsin or the protease inhibitor is then being destroyed or it's being overwhelmed. So who's winning that battle is no doubt the protease wreaking havoc in the upper lobe. Now, what does that mean? This is the pink puffer. I haven't told you why this patient's pink yet versus the blue bloater. Blue bloater, we got that. Blue because extreme cyanosis. Extreme cyanosis further contributed by the secondary polycythemia. Bloater, because remember, when you have COPD, you have difficulty with getting air out. Hence, the FEV1 to FEC ratio is low. If you can't get the air out, air then gets trapped in the lungs. Therefore, you are no doubt going to be bloated. But are you going to have barrel chest like you would in emphysema? No, but you will be bloated. That's your blue bloater. Pink puffer? Not yet, but this is the emphysema patient. I'm going to show you chest x-ray in which you are then going to have barrel chest. Why is that, Dr. Raj? Because in emphysema, you're not going to focus more on the bronchi. Your focus is going to be on the lung parenchyma. Okay? Because in the lung parenchyma, we have elastic tissue. So in the matrix, we then have elastic tissue. That elastic tissue then contributes to something called recoil. That's important. Not expansion, but recoil. What does that mean? Think of a thick, 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 thick rubber band. When you try to stretch that rubber band, what does it want to do? Boom, recoil. Boom, it wants to come together. That's what elastic tissue is in the lung. The elastic tissue wants to recoil. So we can do what? <sighs> Breathe out. <sighs> Breathe out. In emphysema, the fundamental problem is that the elastic tissue is being destroyed by elastase. For example, for example, where in uh, central lobular? Upper lobes. As you can continue destroying the lung tissue, and you lose your elastic recoil. The lung becomes more compliant, more compliant. Hence, you have barrel chest. Hence, you have hyperinflation. Hence, you have hyperlucency. Hence, you have flattening of the diaphragm. Hence, the retrosternal space is going to be increased. Hence, you have the markings of the palming artery. All that good stuff that I'm going to show you in a bit. That's emphysema. 
All right, now this is central alveolar. So your job is to make sure that you tell the patient to stop smoking. And hopefully they have cessation programs. So elastic recoil, now you understand that. There's going to be increase on compliance. Yes, barrel chest. What does that look like on chest x-ray? Ah, here it is. What am I looking at, Dr. Raj? Well, this is a lateral view, obviously. Look at the diaphragm. What diaphragm? Exactly. It's flattened. Because both lungs bilaterally are pushing, 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 increase compliance, decrease surface area, decrease oxygen gas exchange. Hence the hypoxemia. In chronic bronchitis, what happened? Interpulmonary shunt due to a mucus plug. Is that clear? Pulmonary arterial hypertension, right-sided heart failure, maybe core pulmonal, but you're definitely going to have right axis deviation, things that you want to look out for in chronic bronchitis. In emphysema, you're looking for this. So flattened diaphragm is what you're seeing here. Next, you find, see the retrosternal, this arrowhead, that arrowhead that you see there then represents retrosternal space. That should not be so significant. It should be less than two and a half centimeters. The fact that you find so much space between the sternum and the chest wall is further indication of barrel chest and emphysema. The dotted or the dash arrow that you see here is the pulmonary artery, which has undergone increased resistance. And both the areas of the lung are hyperinflated, the flattening of the diaphragm. We're almost done here. So this is center of center. We just talked about this. It affects the respiratory bronchioles, but it'll spare what? The alveoli. That's less of the case in chronic bronchitis. The alveoli will perish, hence the blue. I still haven't talked to you about the pink. I'll give you that in a second. In central alveolar, it tends to occur, affect the upper lobe. It's not due to alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then here we go. So here we, here we have the weapons, right? And the weapons being what? The weapons being your elastase coming from the neutrophils. So I want you to think of the neutrophils being drones. And from the drones, it's then dropping the bombs. The bombs are the proteases or the elastases. It was actually trying to go after the what? The antigens that was being produced by the smoking. But instead of that, what ended up happening was that you also had collateral damage of the elastic tissue, therefore causing decrease in elastic recoil and increased compliance. All of that should make perfect sense. Hence, you are going to have an increase in total lung capacity. Hence, you're going to have an increase in function residual capacity, but you'll have a decrease in FEV1 to FEC ratio. Now, not only will that elastase cause damage too, the alveoli. This is what's different. And beautiful pathogenesis here, but not so much for the patient, obviously. But the point being is, with those bombs being released by, as my neutrophil, PMN, polymorphonucleoside, and it's dropping the elastase or protease. Not only may it then destroy the V, which is ventilation, but in addition, let's say that the elastase is in such great abundance that it's also causing destruction of the vasculature. What's the vasculature represent, the V or the Q? Oh, the Q. So that also is decreasing. So when both of the parameters of the ratio are decreasing, what then happens to the ratio? Not much of a change, even though there's pathology. So you will have hypoxemia, you will most likely going to have hypercapnia resulting in respiratory acidosis, but the patient is not going to appear immediately cyanotic. So, I mean, I couldn't really show you that here too, too much, but what I wish to show you was once again, uh, that the patient, the chronic bronchitis patient would be cyanotic and the patient who's skinny wouldn't have the cyanosis as much, but what that patient would be doing, what this patient would be doing with his lips, because now the lung has become extremely flimsy, very weak, decreased surface area, therefore decrease in diffusion of your oxygen and gas exchange. But what the patient is gonna do now is as the patient is breathing out, the lung gets smaller, it should have, the bronchioles are getting contracted because you have less air as you breathe out. And because you don't have the elastic tissue, the bronchioles 
we're going to close. But the patient instinctfully or has been advised to purse his lips upon expiration. Coming out of my mouth, just to make sure we're all clear. Pursing of the lips upon expiration then causes a resistor in a series. All comes back down to physiology. So if this is a tube and air is my air, and the air is moving out in that direction from left to right, from left to right, what's going to happen is... When you purse your lip, let's say right there are the lips of this patient. And when that patient then purses his lips, when you add a resistance in a series, not a parallel, but in a series, what's going to happen to the pressure proximally? Oh, it's going to increase. That is correct. I don't care what happens to the pressure distally. Who cares what happens to the pressure outside of the mouth? You're, you're trying to protect the patency of the airway before you reach the mouth. In other words, the airways the trachea and the bronchi and such, right? The method that you can conservatively do that to keep your airways open, and you tell this patient all the time, is to then purse his lips or her lips, depending on the gender, so that they are then introducing a resistance series, increasing the pressure proximally, so that hopefully they are then keeping the airways open. The beautiful is to add that physiology integrates into that when you recommend pursing of the lips. Know that well. Almost done here. Panicinor. This is the problem with alpha-1 antitrypsin. You must memorize serine. PI stands for protease inhibitor or protease and then inhibitor. So serine or serpent A1 on chromosome 14. Why do you need to know such detail? I have to give you more detail that's appearing on the boards now. Because in the United States, it is the third most common Lethal genetic disease in the Caucasian population. You ever heard of Down syndrome? You ever heard of cystic fibrosis? Come on now. Those are the that, that that then rounds up the three most common genetic lethal diseases in the Caucasian population. What are they again? What are they again? Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. You know everything about that. Cystic fibrosis, PH508, of course, you know about CFTR, you know about, you know about chromosome seven, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? Well, with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, it is the long arm of chromosome 14. It is serine protease inhibitor. And you're going to check for this because it may be deficient. We're still not quite done. There's a little bit more detail. Now, AAT stands for alpha-1 antitrypsin. These are the genes that encode for it. You're always going to do that as part of a panel and emphysema just to make sure. Remember, the average age of onset of panacin or emphysema or emphysema in an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency without smoking is 45. That's young, 45. That's my age developing emphysema. That's young. That's without smoking. With smoking, Sure but that'd be at the age of 35, almost a decade younger. So therefore the smoking is then going to exacerbate the issues of alpha and antitrypsin deficiency. 35, that's like a baby, my goodness gracious. Now you must know normal, normal, P-I-M-M. -M. So for every M that you didn't pick up, the more alpha one antitrypsin that you're producing from where? The liver, the hepatocyte, endoplasmic reticulum because you know that I'm gonna show you pathology in the liver when you have homozygous type of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, aren't I? Of course I am. So PIMM is perfectly normal, homozygous. For every Z that you pick up, now Z is a little bit important here. Now this kind of behaves like uh, sickle cell disease in African-American patient. In African-American patient, many African-American patients suffer from sickle cell disease. Hence, in heavily African-American populated neighborhoods, you're going to find a number of sickle cell disease clinics, aren't you, across America? As such, 
we have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in the Caucasian population, which is then going to test for alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, AAT, D stands for deficiency. And I say sickle cell disease because you should know that when you have HBSS, that's homozygous. That's homozygous, hip sickle cell disease. That patient is going to have dactylitis and pain in the hands at the age of maybe uh, 18 months, early, young, right? Now, in the Caucasian population, as I told you earlier, that emphysema might start kicking in without the smoking at the age of 45. This is homozygous, ZZ. Now, what do you need to know about Z? This is what you need to know. Now, this is new material that is on your boards now, and you all must know it, the substitution. Remember, with sickle cell disease, the substitution was the glutamic acid, which was then being replaced by valine at the sixth position, correct? Everyone knows that. Your screening test is E6V. E stands for glutamic acid, sixth position of the hemoglobin or the beta chain, and then the V stands for valine. Everyone knows that. You all should know that. Similarly, with alpha-1 antitrypsin, it is the glutamic acid, which is then being substituted by the lysine at position 342. Memorize that further. So it's a glutamic acid that is being substituted by the lysine at position 342. Why the detail? Why is it so important? Most common anemia in the African-American population, hemoglobin, uh, sickle cell disease, hemoglobin SS. Three most common genetic lethal diseases in the Caucasian population, down, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. All the details must be known. The most common, let's say, primary thrombophilia in a female or in, let's say, population autoimmune tends to be females. Factor V laden, know all the details there. Glutamic acid, lysine, 342. All good stuff. Know it forevermore. So those of you that are really good for histology, know for a fact that I'm not showing you the lung. Or if you didn't know, that's all right. Remember, in pan is synar emphysema. So if it was PIZZ, then what other organ would then be affected as well? Oh, no doubt the liver. No doubt the liver. And so therefore, what you're finding here with pan is synar emphysema is the fact that the liver was trying to produce the alpha-1 antitrypsin. That did not happen. But the liver is desperate. The body is desperate for producing protease inhibitor, a.k.a. alpha-1 antitrypsin on chromosome 14. Things that I've talked about already. Now, once you find that this is not present and you have a problem with serpent, 1A, in the liver, here's my hepatocyte. Now, be careful. If you had a patient that was an alcoholic, Maybe you're thinking about alcoholic hepatitis, and maybe you were thinking about malady bodies or intermediate cytokeratin filaments. No, the patient here is a, is a smoker, maybe. It doesn't have to be. It could be alpha-1 antitrypsin. It has issues with uh, COPD. And therefore, in the liver, no doubt, this is not a malady body. You've ruled out the history of what? Maybe hepatitis, viral hepatitis. In viral hepatitis in the liver, you would then find these calcium bodies. These are not what we're seeing here. Hence, the history becomes important because to a layman, so you're going through first year, second year, third year, fourth year medical school, and you have three major livers that you must know that may seem a little similar in terms of their parents. These include the globules that you find here and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. They're, they were supposed to be. They were destined to become alpha-1 antitrypsin, but the patient has P-I-Z-Z, homozygous. Hence, develop what? These globules. Number two, the calcium bodies, but you have to have history of what? Viral hepatitis or the intermediate set of keratin filaments. You would have to have the history of what? Alcohol hepatitis. Those are the three major liver pathologies that you want to keep in mind as you move forward forevermore, forevermore. And if you haven't done that, do that now because it very likely could get confused if you weren't paying attention. Something else I need to bring to your attention now is that this patient with PIZZ in his or her teens will end up developing hepatitis, All right? Remember, hepatitis just means hepatitis. You could have alcoholic hepatitis. You could have viral hepatitis. You could have uh, NASH, non-alcoholic steroid hepatitis. You could have autoimmune hepatitis. You could have hepatitis due to uh, hemochromatosis or Wilson disease. I mean, hepatitis just is nonspecific. 
and you have at least eight to ten different differentials on your step for hepatitis. What I'm giving you here is hepatitis due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in a teen. But then by the time this patient goes into, let's say, 30s, has now gone into cirrhosis. And it is at risk of developing HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, at which point you're going to look for increased alpha fetal protein. All righty. All good stuff. All relevant. All relevant. Okay. And finally here, just a few words, and then because uh, it's been quite a bit of time since I've uh, been doing this now. I uh, do have heterozygous, the PISC, but um, a slight increase in emphysema risk. Panacinar tends to affect lower lobe. It destroys everything. Pan, my topic, pan. Earlier central lobular, smoke rises, upper lobe. Physical signs, this is for chronic bronchitis, the edema we talked about, central cyanosis, right-sided heart failure resulting in edema. Stocky, overweight, normal chest x-ray tends to be. The wheezes and the crackles represents the edema and the fluid within the lungs and chronic bronchitis. Blue bloater. Remember the chest x-ray on emphysema was barrel chest. Not so much fluid, but destruction of elastic tissue. What do crackles sound like? Velcro that I gave you earlier. Ronca is like snoring. That also then represents fluid. Sl slow rumbling. <laughs> Literally sounds like that. <laughs> Percussion is normal in chronic bronchitis. JVD, right-sided heart failure, internal jugular vein, positive jug jugular venous distension. And core pulmonar. Oh, goodness gracious, what am I looking at here in ECG? This is what you're looking at. Quickly show you core pulmonar. You're going to focus on the right side of the heart. Two, three, AVF. It is then perfused or represents the right coronary artery. Does it not? It does. And then which precordial lead is pre pre predominantly the right side or the medial side of the heart? V1. In these leads, you're going to focus upon the following on step one, step two, CK, and step three. What wave am I encircling? Not the P. I mean, excuse me, not the T as in Tom, but it is indeed the P as in Paul. So that Paul wave or the P wave is tented. Dr. Raj, I never heard of P tenting. Well, now you have. Must I know it? Yes, you must, because core pulmonar is asked on your step. Do I need to know all 12 ECGs? Of course you do. Are they going to give you a history of chronic bronchitis? Absolutely. Three months of productive cough for two consecutive years. All that good stuff. Heavy, stocky. Maybe a little bit of dyspnea, quite a bit of cyanosis, secondary polycythemia, all the good stuff that I just given you, ladies and gentlemen. And then in addition, on ECG, due to the pulmonary hypertension, this patient has now developed core pulmonal. And as soon as core pulmonal starts kicking in, what happened to morbidity, mortality in your patient? <whistles> Increased. Not good. You don't want to see this. There's a few other things here with tachycardia and such, but not for today. That'll be a discussion for... Uh, Cardio ECG. Oh, goodness gracious. FEV1, your standard here, is called gold. All right, that's what, we're gonna use, that's what you use on step one. Your FEV1 to FEC ratio, no doubt, in COPD is decreased. But for chronic bronchitis, you're going to use chronic bronchitis, G-O-L-D, the Global Initiative of Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, O-L-D. Focus on that, obstructive lung disease. Then you have uh, things like mild and, and moderate and severe and very severe, four golds. That's good enough for step one. On your, at this point, at this point, but uh, I'll talk to you more about that at some point in our course. Uh, the physical signs and emphysema are the following. You're going to have uh, absent edema. Positive JVD is absent. Central cyanosis is absent. Uh, accessory muscles are being used because the lung literally is being destroyed. This is the patient that was thin that I showed you earlier in the clinic. I showed you the chest x-ray. And because of all that air within the lung, everything's decreased upon auscultation. So decreased breath sounds, decreased heart sounds, prolonged <sighs> expiration. You're going to have hyperinflation with lungs. So therefore, upon percussion, it's going to be hyperresonant, isn't it? Hyperresonant. 
JVD is absent. Pursing the lips with disgust. Okay, quick, a few uh, quick words here about uh, management, and then we'll call it a day. But uh, with management and chronic bronchitis, you're going to focus upon making sure that you take, uh, take the uh, conservative approach and uh, use lozenges and hot tea. And if that doesn't work, maybe, maybe antibiotics. But nowadays, remember, because of bacterial resistance or antibiotic resistance, that you want to be careful that you do not develop clostridium. It used to be called clostridium difficile, no longer. It's called clostridi clostridioides difficile associated diarrhea, or CDAD is what it's called now. It used to be called clostridium, but no longer on your step and clinically. And CDAD stands for clostridioides associated diarrhea. That's a possibility. And if that occurs, that becomes really difficult to manage. Hence, try to avoid antibiotics. Your focus is make sure that you uh, are able to uh, manage a coughing. Lozenges remove the smoking. And you are worried about dextromethorphan. They'll ask you this in pharma. Dexamethorphan is one of those drugs that works on the sigma receptors in the respiratory center to suppress the cough. What does it do? Dexamethorphan is a sigma receptor stimulant in the cough respiratory center in the medulla. Now, the problem is the following. It's unpredictable. I need you to think dexamethorphan, sigma, and serotonin. Millions of Americans right now that are on antidepressants, antidepressants, antidepressants. Oh, I am depressed. Oh, I am taking a slew of SSRIs. Oh, on top of that, I'm a smoker. Oh, I've developed chronic bronchitis. I hate the coughing. Let me now take some drugs. I take a cough suppressant that is known as dexamethorphan. I'm also taking an SSRI. The combination of the two makes your limbs go like this. Whoo! Makes your temperature go. Whoo! You've developed serotonin syndrome. You might not come back. Is it really worth it? Keep in mind. Guaranteed you get a question. Guafenicin is an expectorant. And then management for emphysema here. Bronchodilators, without a doubt. Pursing the lips, obviously, is temporary. Usually, matters are going to get worse, aren't they? What kind of chemoreceptors is the patient now uh, dependent upon? The peripheral chemoreceptors? Because... The central chemoreceptors are no longer functioning due to the chronic carbon dioxide. Make sure you're clear with that. Supplemental oxygen, pulmonary rehab, and then something called lung volume reduction surgery. They are asking you the rationale on your steps now. Why? What does it do? You literally surgically, if the patient is eligible, first and foremost, you take out the wedges of the emphysematic lung. You remove, excise the areas of the lung in which they are undergoing emphysematous changes. What's my fundamental problem with emphysema? Destruction of the elastic tissue caused by protease, aka elastase, fundamental issue. If you're able to somehow salvage the elastic tissue, just perhaps, just perhaps, you may be able to restore some of that elastic recoil by removing the emphysematic tissue. Beautiful concept, know the rationale. And then in addition, if you start removing enough of that tissue, lung volume reduction, surgery, it's usually done by bronchoscopy because uh, not always predictable is this, but the rationale you must know physiologically for step one and step two CK is that by then restoring some of that lung recoil, maybe the diaphragm will start functioning again, physiologically. And if that occurs, maybe it'll be able to breathe better. Remember the problem with COPD is breathing out. And so just perhaps, just perhaps a dynamic compression in which the bronchioles wish to collapse because the cartilage no longer is protecting it. If you, if you restore some of that diaphragmatic type of functioning, maybe, just maybe, you have avoided long-term sequelae. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all that I have for you today. Um, it's, uh, if you're here, fantastic. And uh, I know many of you were asking for this repeat. So here it is. It's out there in the world. Enjoy. Take what you want out of it. I wish you the best of luck. Please be safe. And uh, I'll see you when I see you. Ciao, Bella. <laughs>